Hi, I'm Emily, and I'm a level one chef. Hi, I'm Daniel, and I'm a level two chef. Hi, I'm Yuji. I've been a professional chef for eight years. So today, I'm going to be making Swedish meatballs, roughly in the style of Ikea's meatballs. I modeled my meatball recipe after albondigas, which are basically mini meatballs, sort of, which are cooked in this really awesome sauce. Today, I'll be making tsumire soup. Tsumire means fish meatball in Japanese. It's a great way to utilize all the fish scraps you get out of day-to-day -day restaurant productions. Uh, so I am opting for a combo, a 50-50 split of ground beef and ground pork. Pork actually adds a lot of moisture, and that, I think, is the extent of my knowledge on that. It's ground beef. One, I like beef. Easy. Uh, two, you don't have to worry so much about, like, if you accidentally undercook beef a little, it's not going to hurt anybody, which is a relief when you're a level one chef. This tuna was caught by line hook. Uh, line hook is the most sustainable way of fishing because you don't catch any other fish. So first I'm gonna be scraping tuna uh, bones to get the meat out. So this part of the meat is called the nakaochi in Japanese, means uh, almost like a rib meat. And then a lot of times, restaurants actually scrape this meat and they make a tuna tartare and they serve it in a maki rolls. All right, let's scrape and get some meat out. It's rather satisfying when you get the meat out. You want to make sure that the tip of the spoon goes deep so that there is really nothing left. And then this part is called the blood line. And this part is really good too. A lot of it like nice irony flavor. This is very satisfying. So, to start these meatballs off, I'm going to saute some onions with some garlic. And I'm gonna set them aside to cool before actually adding them into the meatballs. Um, and now I'm just gonna bring this pan up to medium heat. So now I'm gonna take these and add them into my pan. Uh, while that's going, I will work on the garlic. So these I wanna get nice and fine. This gets added in with the onion. I'm gonna add a little salt, a little pepper. I'm just gonna transfer all these pieces into a bowl. And they're just gonna sit and kind of cool down while I work on the rest of the meatball mixture. You can almost see through the other side. It's almost like a paper. I took most of the meat out, but there is still more you can do. I turned this into a ramen broth at my restaurant. So I have breadcrumbs and milk and eggs, and I'm gonna just combine these. That's my first step. The next thing I'm gonna do is just add my eggs in. There we go. I'm gonna break up my eggs. And now I just wanna make sure this gets good and gloopy. That's the technical term. So now I'm done with the scraping uh, tuna. So I'm gonna mix this evenly so that you have a really nice blend. So before I mix other ingredients, I'm gonna chop this even more finer so that it's gonna be really fluffy and more uh, fatty all around. It's almost like making a tartare with the tuna. I'm trying to break down the bloodline as much as possible too. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is chop up my onion and my garlic. Okay, so I'm putting my onion in raw. Uh, why, Emily? Because I can. I do what I want. I just trust that whoever made this recipe knew what they were doing. <laughs> I particularly don't like to use raw onion when uh, cooking. I just like to cook them first. It really gets like a nice aromatic profile and the, the flavor layering is just much better, I think. The laziest chop is really what this is. I know that this is probably wrong, but this is the way I do this. Because <laughs> here's the thing, it's not like I can't do things that are more difficult, it's just that, you know, somebody's gotta represent that there are lots of times when you don't want to. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. So now I'm going to mix so five grams of scallion, same amount of ginger, a little bit of sesame, miso. So this uh, miso is a special blend of uh, red miso and also sake kasu, uh, which is a leftover from making a uh, sake. When it's used with the fish, it actually uh, kind of balances the flavor of the fish uh, really well. Ground beef and ground pork go into a bowl here. And I'm gonna season these with the oregano some cayenne, some basil, and a little bit of rosemary. I'm kind of gonna alternate between uh, sprinkling breadcrumbs in here and then adding stock. So it's gonna like dry this out a bit um, and then re-wet it with the beef stock. An egg. An egg. And this just serves as another binder. So when it cooks, it doesn't like fall apart. Let's see if I can do this with the gloves on. It's gonna be interesting. And a little bit of olive oil. And the onions. I'm just going to get my onion into my meat. Two garlic cloves. Salt. Salt. A little bit of pepper. pepper. And I'm just going to sport that all in. Just mix everything. 
I'm gonna put a little bit of soy sauce. You don't wanna season this too much because you're gonna be eating with the uh, miso soup. Fingers at the ready. It's gonna be gross. All right, let's do this. Do people use spoons for this? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that there are more sanitary ways. I don't know. Gloves. It's like carving a pumpkin of beef. Then I could just take it off, fling it into the garbage. I'm going for like around a rounded golf ball size. So abundigas are typically smaller meatballs, almost like bite size, you know? Bing. So I'll be using a spoon, so it actually helps to make the foam easier instead of with your hand. It's almost like I'm making dumpling. <laughs> Maybe I'll just add a little to some of the smaller ones. Little meat hats for all my ball friends. My meatballs are ready to move on to the next step, so I'm going to cover them in plastic wrap and put them in the fridge for a couple hours uh, so that they stay ball-like when I cook them. So here is my tuna tomato meatball, and now we're ready to be poured in a miso soup. Cool, so the meatballs are formed and they are ready to be cooked. So uh, tomato meatball is a soup dish. So I'll be making the, the base of the stock, which is called the dashi. Dashi is a, a combination of this bonito flake and then also the kombu. So you're gonna put the kombu into the pot with the water and then you're gonna start heating up from the cold water. And then you wanna steep it at the medium temperature for about 10, 15 minutes until uh, kombu floats up. And then you don't want to boil kombu, it actually kills the flavor. That's why before you get boiled, I'm going to take the kombu out. And then when this starts boiling, we're going to add a bonito flake into it. And I'm going to let it steep for another 10, 15 minutes. Now my dashi is finished and then I'm going to strain it. The color looks nice golden brown. This is the ideal color of dashi that you're looking for when you make dashi. It smells awesome. <laughs> So if you go to farmer's market in America, you see beautiful fennel and then a celery. The special aroma that comes from uh, these two ingredients are very friendly to Japanese like fundamental flavors such as miso and soy sauce. So I'll be keeping this fennel top because I want to use this little part for the garnish later. So now uh, celery and the fennels are chopped up and then ready for miso soup. So I'm going to be starting from the cold temperature and I'm gonna raise it to uh, simmering uh, temperature. It's gonna go about 15 minutes or so. So now vegetables are soft enough to blend. So I'm gonna use a hand uh, blender and I'm gonna blend it. So now vegetables and the dashes are all nicely blended. So I'm gonna uh, add miso and then yuzu kosho. Yuzu kosho is a combination of yuzu peel and then a green pepper and a salt. It just fermented for about a half year. Then I'm gonna mix it even more. Now my tsumire miso soup is uh, uh, finished. Uh, so my meatballs have been cooling for a little bit and they are ready for cooking. This is less of an overall cooking and more of like a browning. I'm trying to brown all sides, get them warm and sort of semi-cooked through uh, and the rest they're actually gonna finish in the sauce. So I'm going to go ahead and heat up my pan, add some oil and then start browning my balls. I'm gonna set this on like a medium yeah, like a medium heat. Nothing bad can happen on medium. In general, you actually don't want to boil the miso soup once miso is added to the soup because the, it actually kind of destroys the flavor of the miso. So you want to keep the temperature below simmering. I'm going to add a little olive oil. Call number one. I will say they have, despite the fridging, found a, a nice flat bottom, but that's okay. So I'm going to start poaching my tuna meatballs. So you actually disappear into the miso soup, but once it's cooked, it's going to start appearing. It will take about uh, three to five minutes for the tuna meatball to be fully cooked. This is looking all right. I'm gonna give this a flip. I'm not really too concerned about them cooking all the way through at this point, just because they're gonna finish in the sauce. All right, I'm gonna say that these are as cooked as they need to be. I think it looks pretty darn tasty. So the tuna meatballs are looking very good. So a brown on one side, right? And then a brown on the other. That's my done. So uh, here are my meatballs, and the next thing I'm gonna do is just make a sauce for them. Time for the sauce. Okay, so to make my sauce, I have my pan with my meatball drippings. I have to add in my butter. I'm just going to melt this butter. I'm gonna swish it around a little. I'm gonna throw a little bit more olive oil in here and start with my onion, which is actually the second half of the onion from before. I just kinda wanna soften them, let them soak up all the, the oil and the, the flavor that's already in the pot. So now the onions are in, I'm gonna throw in a little bit of salt and some pepper. All right, so I'm just going to put my flour in and then whisk it, making kind of a roux. 
Uh, so the onions look good. They like said they're nice and they're clear. And now I'm going to add my liquid components. I'm going to start with the crushed tomatoes. I'm going to add my beef stock and whisking. It's so much easier when there's no one around to judge you. <laughs> now I'm going to start adding my cream in. This is going to be delicious. I'm very excited. Yeah, it's a little bit of red wine. Now, I had never used red wine in cooking prior to trying this recipe out a bunch. It's actually pretty insane how much flavor you can get from wine and food. I thought it was just something that really, really fancy chefs would do. Next thing I'm adding is my soy sauce. Just use my little spoon to add my mustard. All right, now that my sauce is almost ready, I'm gonna put my meatballs into the sauce. We're gonna let them simmer in the sauce for about like 15, 20 minutes. And in that time, not only will they be cooked all the way through, they will also have soaked in so much flavor from the sauce. All right, I think these Swedish meatballs are good to go. For my garnish, I'm planning to use a leek and also a myoga, which is a Japanese uh, young uh, fresh ginger. I'm gonna try to cut this in a one bite. And then we're gonna open this up. This is called a hari negi. Hari means needle, negi means scallion. Then I'm going to put this in our water here. And then I'm gonna move to Miyoga. Now I'm going to squeeze it like this. Kind of removes the a little bit of a bitterness. It's gonna look good on the garnish and it makes it a little bit easier to eat too. Okay, then I'm gonna transfer this to a strainer. So now my garnish, uh, leek and ginger is already. So for my garnish, I have some fresh parsley, which is really all you need. A lot of the flavor in the meatballs is just perfect. Uh, I don't want to mess with that too much. It does add a nice little pop of color on top. Yeah, so I'm just kind of chopping this down nice and fine. I don't know if you'd call it a garnish per se, but I will be serving my beautiful Swedish meatballs with a little bit of lingonberry jam on the side. They just go. They're meant to be. They're like Harry and Sally. Now I'm gonna put everything together. So I'm gonna start pouring the miso soup in here and then put the tuna meatballs on it. I feel like I'm chasing them. There we go. We'll do three for this. I'll usually do like two to three meatballs, I think. Um, and then what I want to do also is get a little bit of the extra sauce just to drizzle on top of this. This is a leek and then a ginger mixture. Then I'm gonna finish with the fennels. And top it with a little bit of the freshly chopped parsley. Just enough to give it a little, little bit of a flair. So this is the pepper uh, called the sancho. I'm using this because it has a really nice minty flavor that goes well with fish. And there you have it my Swedish meatballs. And these are my albondigas. This is my tuna tsumire meatball soup. All right, let's try these. Salud. Mmm. Mmm, mm-hmm. Mmm, yeah. Wow. I don't like Throw, throw the fork and walk away. It's very good. <laughs> it's super good. It's funny, you can really taste the Dijon. It's not a lot of Dijon, but like, you get you get it in there. I was afraid of the tuna's textures, but it's very soft and fluffy. It's not overcooked at all. It's such a robust um, like profile you're getting. Like You taste the onion, you taste the rosemary, you, you get the pork, and you get like the fat of the beef. The only thing that would make it better is if I was in a table somewhere in Spain eating these. So tomato meatball is a very, uh, like a family meal, and it's not really a special dish. But since I haven't made it so long in America, and it's so good, I feel like I should be making more every day. Meatballs are a versatile and convenient way to serve any kind of ground meat. Let's see how each of our three chefs made theirs. Emily made Swedish style meatballs with ground beef as the main ingredient. It's gonna be gross. All right, let's do this. Ground beef is usually made from less tender cuts of beef. By first soaking her breadcrumbs in milk before mixing into her meatball mixture, the texture of her meatballs became very soft. It's like carving a pumpkin of beef. The wet breadcrumbs helped Emily's meatballs retain moisture really well because the breadcrumbs became gelatinized with the natural meat juices that would have otherwise been cooked out. Emily also added her eggs to this mixture. The eggs bind all of the ingredients together because of the presence of proteins like old albumin in the egg whites that coagulate when heated and connect the meat with the seasonings. The milk and egg yolk also added some additional fat and richness. Daniel's Spanish-inspired meatballs, called albondigas, were made from a mixture of ground beef and pork. 
Pork is a meat from young hogs, and commercial hogs are bred to be lean. Pork is lighter in color than beef for several reasons. Hogs have a lower proportion of red muscles because of the way hogs move around, using their muscles more sporadically than cows. These muscles require less oxygen, so they naturally have less myoglobin, which is a compound that stores oxygen and gives meat its color. The flavor of pork comes from many different chemicals, such as hexanal and octadecanal. Hexanel is associated with grassy flavors, which come from the diet of the hog. And that, I think, is the extent of my knowledge on that. Daniel had a lower ratio of breadcrumbs to meat compared to Emily. The starches in his gluten-free breadcrumbs soaked up the beef broth as they gelatinized, retaining moisture and giving his meatballs a softer, more tender texture. He didn't add an egg, so having less breadcrumbs helped his meatballs retain their shape. Instead of relying on added egg white proteins, he relied on the meat proteins that recoil and become more compact when cooked. Yuji made his Japanese-inspired meatballs out of fresh tuna that he cut from the bone and hand-chopped. Tuna is a large predatory ocean fish that swims constantly at fast speeds, which means they need a lot of oxygen for metabolism. This means they have a lot of oxygen-rich myoglobin, which is why fresh tuna is so deeply red in color, and why some flavor compounds produced during cooking are similar to those of cooked beef. He also added miso, a flavorful paste made from soybeans that are fermented by a mold called Aspergillus oryzae, or koji. Koji is a versatile mold that's used in the fermentation of various ingredients like miso and rice vinegar. Yuji also added his homemade soy sauce, a dark liquid made from fermented soy that varies quite a lot from processor to processor, but is always salty and savory. Emily refrigerated her meatballs for about two hours prior to frying. This was smart. It helps her meatballs to keep their shape because the fat is in solid form when it's cold. She pan fried her meatballs in a small amount of oil and was careful to make sure they were browned all over. Daniel also lightly fried his albondigas in olive oil. Low and slow, because I burn stuff all the time. <laughs> He made sure to expose the entire surface of his meatballs to the hot oil to get a nice crust and set the Maillard reaction in motion. This is a non-enzymatic browning reaction between sugars and amino acids in the ground beef. Products of Maillard browning are hundreds of aromatic rings with oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur groups. These impart roasted, nutty, beefy flavor notes, but also some oniony, earthy, and slightly metallic notes too. It's the complicated set of chemical reactions that makes meat so delicious. Yuji poached his tuna in his soup. Poaching is a gentle cooking process, which allows proteins in the tuna to slowly coagulate, giving them a tender texture. When too much water is present, Maillard browning is inhibited, so there's no roasted or toasted flavor in his meatballs. While Yuji used fewer ingredients, his level three status comes from perfectly balanced flavors. It smells awesome. <laughs> Sometimes knowing how to proportion fewer ingredients with bigger flavor impact increases the difficulty level because each ingredient is so pronounced. Meatballs are so versatile. You can make them with beef, pork, tuna, really any meat or fish you like. There's no shortage of preparation methods either, frying, poaching, or finishing in a sauce. Next time you're in the mood for meatballs, we hope you'll take some of these tips from our three innovative chefs.